Welcome to the Software People Stories. I'm Shiv. I'm Chitra. And I'm Gaiti. We bring you interesting untold stories of people associated with the creation or consumption of software-based solutions. You'll hear stories of what worked and sometimes what didn't. You will also hear very personal experiences and insights that would trigger your thoughts and inspire you to do even greater things. From being a project manager in less than two years of joining the software industry and nearly four decades of a career filled with insights around managing people, staying in the know of technology, continuous learning, and guess what? Starting a business in his 50s. Ramesh Imani, our guest on this episode of the Software People Stories, enriches this conversation with Shivaguru with his unique perspectives like finding a connection between failure and ambition, knowing how much and when to stretch and guiding people on culture as he co-founded his startup and later became part of a larger company. This episode is an intriguing tapestry of a unique career journey with more to come. Listen on. Hi, Ramesh. Welcome to the Software People Stories. Thank you. Thank you, Shavagaru. Nice talking with you. Yeah, I know. This has taken a long time for us to connect. Even though we've been in touch off and on, I don't think uh, we've sat down to talk about the general things and some things that happened in the past and all that. So though I know you for a long time, it's probably better if uh, you can quickly say what all things you've done and how your career has been so that our listeners also get a better idea from the horse's mouth and then we can continue with our conversation. Sure. Uh, in fact, uh, tomorrow, August 1st, uh, will be my 40th year of working. So that way I'm an old man. Okay, I have a lot of, uh, lot of experience. Mm. Uh, started my career after completing master's in IT Kanpur. I have started with the Tata Burrows. Now, later on, it was called Tata Unisys. I worked with them for three years. Most of the time after initial training in Mumbai, I worked outside, outside India, in uh, US and in France. I was uh, maybe lucky or a good opportunity that I became a project manager with one and a half years of experience. My second project, my boss said, I think you can become a project manager and why don't you lead a project? And that was in France. Okay. So that is how in some sense my managerial career has started. So after Tata Burrows, I'm one of the few people at that time, I'm talking of uh, early 80s, who decided I will not settle in US. So I thought I should take uh, some other job uh, uh, in India. And I joined Wipro. When I joined, Wipro was a six crore company. That is the current Wipro Technologies. Uh, it used to be called Wipro Infotech at that time. There were about 200 people, six crore, uh, Wipro's own computer system. It was primarily a hardware company. And I joined as a software person in that company. I stayed with Wipro. I never thought I'll stay that long for 25 years from 1983 till 2008 when an entrepreneurial bug has caught and I decided I should do a startup on my own before I retire. So at the age of close to 50, I started uh, Insta Health Solutions. I, I sold that uh, company after eight years to Practo and I worked with Practo for another four years after the acquisition. And I have retired from Practo and from full-time job as of this April. And now I am trying to do multiple things. So this is a long narration of a long career. Wonderful. Yeah, a lot of questions. In fact, the first question that came to my mind was, uh, you might remember this uh, book called The Mythical Man Month. Yes. Where he talks about the second project syndrome. Yes. So when you said your second project, you became a manager. Hmm. What were some of the things that you wanted to do perfectly? Uh, see, see for, for me, that was a very, very different kind of experience. I worked just for a, in one project in uh, in US, and I worked under a very good boss. In fact, he made a lot of impression on me uh, in terms of you know how one should be empathetic, but at the same time strong in conviction and support to yet delegating. Uh, so like this, I I really I have seen uh, him. I really liked him. So when I became a manager. What happened is, in fact, except one person, most of the other people in my team were senior to me. That itself was a surprise to me. And uh, uh, But we worked well. Okay, It was a good project. We have done fairly well. I think what helped 
at that time and in fact i keep telling the same message to lots of people is uh, just because you become a manager doesn't mean you stop doing things okay manager is does not mean you get things done from others and you don't do it in fact the mantra i follow is that i should not do management work more than 50% of my time i must actively take something that my team is not doing that was the principle and believe me it really worked for me in all the 40 years so that's how i think uh, relative to a lot of other people i was never out of date or out of touch with actually doing things and believe me that really helped in my startup too very nice and very practical also but then um, from being an individual contributor to somebody who needs to get things done from others mm-hmm. and also like you said balancing this how do you switch between these roles probably this happens multiple times in a day right yes so the first thing i tell people is you make a division in fact it is uh, i think in the management theory when uh, at least that is what i learned when somebody was teaching this one they say what is the content job and what is management job content job is the portion what you do yourself and management job is where you are responsible for the work done by others so that balance you know so you can decide that i am doing this job okay so say for example my first project it was a conversion project we were moving the systems from one type of a computer system to another computer system okay so what i said is i will own the the translator okay that does the automation okay so i was really spending a lot of time to make sure that is continuously updated in terms of the that gives good productivity and others whereas the team were doing more of the running of that one like this when you are analyzing what is your kres you can decide which ones i will do myself or i will do in a much more involved way and which are the ones i will give it to my team where i will be less involved so that way people also know when they are working that you are not going to uh, look over their shoulder in terms of what they are doing and at the same time you are not taking eyes of that right so that is the critical thing how much you need to uh, keep an eye how much you need to get involved and what you will do yourself okay if one can get a good balance between these three i think one will one will enjoy okay yeah, the other point uh, that you mentioned also is interesting that in the time that you block for yourself you would do things that the team is not doing yes yes so is it in the same line or in the same context of what the team is doing or is it something completely different no no see in the end you are doing what is your job right and your job involves obviously delivering things using the team you have got so in that sense i don't see me and my team different we have joint responsibility okay now the question is that overall joint responsibility how do you split it what will be done by team 1 team a team b team c team d and you are also one of the team members in that sense and what you will do okay you have an extra responsibility of making sure the work of the team a b c d are also done and done with the right quality okay so the moment you say what are all the task we as a team have to do okay Uh, including management you put that as one of the task elements okay it will be easy for you to decide what you should do personally and what you should get the others to done so with such a full calendar how do you keep up to date so what happens is uh, it's a different aspect see up to date in the sense i have i loved programming when i was but unfortunately i have given up programming in uh, i think 86 is when i last wrote a line of code after that i have not written okay so after that what i felt is i don't have to write code but i must know what teams are doing what is the technology so i started focusing more and more on the overall nature of the tech work okay if you think of databases you know what database what is the difference between this database and that database what is client server architecture versus some other architecture okay what is uh, after some days in the beginning of my career we didn't have oh but after some time you know what is uh, object oriented technologies uh, why it is important where it works so i was trying to make sure i was up to date in terms of a 
overall higher level tech and in few cases i try to get into deep like in in insta uh, on the tech what i was saying is i try to keep myself focused on the new techniques new technologies that are happening at a higher level so i was not into implementation aspects of the technology but in terms of where the technology should be used in kind of a management decisions on technology so the example i can give is in in insta uh, we were one of the first to use amazon cloud okay uh, in fact we were having a local server which we placed it in a data center for serving our customers and when that uh, that was an ibm server and uh, the amc was over uh, so they were asking for a lot of money and that is when amazon has come so we said we don't to move to this one so what i did is amazon has a nice uh, small course for business people online okay so i went through that course myself and believe me it really helped me to understand so that when i talk with my engineering team and others it helped me you know uh, what exactly is cloud what is ec2 what is uh, various db layers what they have got and uh, you know what is the difference between small medium all the basics i was able to follow so like this my focus always was make sure you are conversant with the tech okay not from an implementation but you should be able to get into discussions okay so that is how you will be able to give a good direction or if you have to take a decision or you can participate actively in certain tech discussions otherwise you will become a bystander i remember i may recall you mentioning a few days ago that uh, you enrolled for an ai ml course yes recently yeah yeah this was post my full time job i was free and i was very intrigued by what is happening on uh, in ai ml okay you you hear a lot and uh, you read a lot both from management perspective and from uh, from societal perspective so i thought let me get into depth okay so first time i have joined a course i think after uh, the my college and uh, i i was quite excited in fact i really enjoyed the course uh, i had to to complete the course properly they have given a lot of uh, exercises and you have to do those exercises in active or matlab so it gave me opportunity to learn matlab and i was telling people i wrote a code after 36 years uh, okay but it was good okay so i think one need to ask oneself that in this tech business you must always be ready to be a student okay then uh, believe me you will when we even enjoy uh, at least i enjoyed a lot understanding new tech and uh, being able to talk with people on the tech wonderful and so far uh, all this has had a fairly technical flavor and then you mm-hmm. also ran one of the largest business units yeah so how was that transition when you had to deal probably more with excel than uh, with people or tech yes yeah so one of the things i like uh, in wipro and uh, they have really encouraged a lot of people he is to do a cross functional movement okay so i got that real cross functional movement when we pro got an opportunity to work with ge maybe there is a big story how ge came to india and uh, how we got involved for various reasons lucky for me i was the guy uh, who was handling the ge business okay so i went for the uh, first time when ge invited various uh, indian vendors whom they there is a high level shortlist to get into deep dive on the first set of projects so i represented wipro uh, narayan murthy came from infosys and we had uh, senior uh, uh, tcs director in fact lots of people were very senior people i was the i think the youngest and the junior most guy in that uh, ge team okay then uh, we got our first set of projects so i told my boss i got the first ge projects let me move to us and uh, manage the ge account he was very happy he said yes you go and uh, do it so that was my first sales career till then i was a techy okay so i got into a sales job and for one year i was doing pure sales okay because i had no team i was all alone in us it was kind of a first to sales job or rather i was the first sales guy from wipro in us to to drive this business i was based in hartford uh, connecticut uh, so driving a lot every day trying to meet customers or do cold calling selling them what we can do and how we can do okay so that first year but uh, at heart i am not a sales guy you know uh, in terms of you know doing sales 100% of the time is not my cup of enjoyment so after one year i told my boss i would rather come back to india i will have somebody do the sales reporting to me i'll manage the sales but i'll not run sales directly do the sales so i came back to india and uh, we made that into a business unit the whole ge business because it was so big so i was running so that is my first business unit head role where i was responsible for the entire operations 
that is the sales for the delivery and everything else and as that businesses grew i think uh, i became more and more a business unit head so i in fact i tell people i moved into that role i think way back in 91 uh, so from 91 till till uh, this year 2020 all of these years my role was more or less like a business unit head and i enjoyed it because being a business unit head it gives you opportunity to work in multiple areas you can work in large account management when you have to work with accounts being a business unit head is the role what i enjoyed most because it gives you a flavor to work in multiple functional aspects you can focus on sales you can focus on delivery you can work on tech you you work on some proposals new proposals to the customers where you get into sometimes a deeper uh, uh, technical proposals and of course managing the people grooming the people you know recruiting people uh, all of those aspects sometimes even building and offices and all of those things also okay what about the aspect of uh, ambiguity that comes with it when you're in a tech problem solving mode or implementation at least you can see some results the progress and all that mm -hmm. whether it is a selling services or as a business unit head when you make business plans or when you make these assumptions mm -hmm. how uncomfortable does it make you see, it, it is not about uncomfort uh, discomfort see what i tell people is in the end uh, any planning planning is about what is possible and what is your ambition okay you have to have a good balance between both of them if you are not ambitious enough and you don't stretch enough then it means you are leaving things on the table and that is not good for you or good for the company and at the same time you have to be realistic in terms of what can be delivered or what can be achieved with the resources what you got with the people you got with the, the money you got okay with your ability to for example in those days when we are growing very heavily you know it was our ability to recruit okay how good a recruitment engine you got or how good a training engine you got so it is it is a question of balancing and you should be prepared to fail to some extent in fact what premji used to say is in out of 3 years you should fail at least one year in terms of meeting your targets okay two years you may meet one year you can fail if you are not failing and if you are consistently meeting your number it means you are not ambitious enough okay so as long as you think not meeting the numbers is a, is a failure okay it is not a failure okay that maybe you tried hard but you didn't do it it is okay okay if you have that notion and if your management supports you in that then there is not so much of an ambiguity mm, very nice so that fear of failure can be overcome when you know that there is a safety net and there is someone to back you up yeah, yeah. and and you know you have you have put in your best efforts okay so that is where i keep saying you know that balance comes in you know you are stretching that will not kill the company okay i know sometimes people take enormous risks okay you cannot do that and particularly in a startup kind of scenario uh, that is also very very critical you need to know where you can stretch that will not kill you your team your company or your relationships but they all know you are stretching okay because without stretch i don't think people will perform yeah that nicely leads me to the next question that came to my mind which is in a startup context mm -hmm. where probably the cost of delays in decisions or cost of maybe wrong decisions in hindsight are much higher mm -hmm. than in a larger corporation mm -hmm. uh, how did that transition happen no you will make mistakes i don't think there is any any doubt on that see so because let us accept in a in a startup unlike in a bigger company where you are working on established problems uh, or established solutions okay or established way of doing things in a startup you are doing something new okay uh, maybe it is done in the industry but you don't know or you don't have people who know how to do it right so the biggest challenge in startups is lack of knowledge okay like if i knew what i knew today for insta health 10 12 years back because i had no background on uh, indian market and i had no background on healthcare when i started insta health okay so we have to learn a learn lot of things okay so because of that learning uh, you will make some mistakes so as long as you you are constantly monitoring that am i risking more than i can chew and are you able to retrace your steps back if you have gone forward with certain things then you are okay i remember we have taken 15 sales guys to sell our product before our product was ready i didn't realize our product was not ready 
okay mm-hmm. we realized mm-hmm. the product was not ready after we started selling and all those people started selling so i have to really bring it down we cut down the people to two we said no point in trying to have so many sales people when you don't have a product so how did you identify the problem to solve with insta yeah it is see well, maybe it is a little bit more at a personal level see when i left wipro i was running uh, a billion dollar business with a very large team focused on the western market and it was a services business and i was working in the product engineering space so i used to have as customers very large tech companies okay so in fact all the semiconductor companies were my customers like you know ti intel analog devices you know you name it qualcomm uh, you name a company in semiconductors so including nec in japan and many of them or we were working with all the top telecom companies so i spent lot of time talking with the product companies understanding what are their product i was very enamored of that so i said you know the reason why i am leaving wipro is to do something else something new not to repeat what i have done in wipro so i said i will i want to do a product business two i said i spend enough time in the western market let me work in the emerging markets okay so two contrarian maybe uh, in fact one of the vcs when i went to him for funding he said ramesh you are a fool you you should work on your strength you are working on your weaknesses uh, i won't fund you mm. okay okay but but i thought i am ready to learn and uh, you know it it is is more fun and also for some reason i believe that uh, emerging markets is a huge market opportunity and people who can crack that they could be as successful as the people you know when we started the whole outsourcing from india to the us and western markets right before that nobody did it and it was a great success uh, servicing the western market i thought there will be similar success with the emerging markets uh, with india based products because the challenges of all these uh, all the companies in these emerging markets they are not similar and the western software solutions will not work in these markets so we should uh, work on this and it could be a big opportunity so that was my pitch to the vcs and others to say you know this is a good space and i picked up healthcare because i thought that is one area where western solutions may not work because their cost structures uh, in the emerging markets is very different from the western markets so i thought that is how i picked up healthcare as a product solution for the emerging markets nice having done that the other big difference that i see in terms of a large corporate and a startup is mm-hmm. what broadly goes as culture mm-hmm. one thing that you mentioned about your own style of working was to be at least hands on to a reasonable extent hmm. and in corporates over time you do have a lot of support systems that are there for you and you tend to depend on them mm-hmm. so one is you doing it are you accepting to do anything that you want or anything that is needed but how do you spread the same culture or same values for the team that you are building in a startup where there is a lot of excitement but the future is not very clear so there are two three ways to address this issue one is you get people who are doers okay because you you know there are some people who are good managers and who are not doers themselves in fact particularly i must say you know sometimes i used to even say to a lot of my wipro team members that you know you are becoming a manager don't become okay be a doer mm. to mm. some extent okay so that was one thing you know so we had a very level people like we had engineering manager obviously who is a good coder okay so because that is how that is what you need in a startup okay so i used to sit to write proposals in fact i i wrote the entire content for our website i was doing all the ppts uh, for our sales team i did all the proposals for our team okay so uh, the the key is getting doers in a startup whereas in a large company you know because of the size the coordination is very very critical okay that is how a lot of people become managers because they are good coordinators that is needed because of the size but in a startup uh, when you are a small team you don't need coordinators you need you need doers yeah because one of my career transitions was based on a challenge that was posed to me saying that being in a small company can you recreate the same kind of enthusiasm and atmosphere in a larger company when they were going through an acquisition and a merger so to say mm-hmm. of a small company into a larger company Mm-hmm. so yeah there were a lot of funny incidents that happened in the first few months mm-hmm. where as a small company you start doing something and then suddenly says oh that is not that is my job mm-hmm. and he say oh i don't know i thought we just had to get things done mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Oh, believe me, that is a very different problem. Uh, I have seen that on both the sides. In Wipro, I was involved in acquiring four companies. Okay, one in Europe, one in Singapore, one in Japan. In fact, two in Europe. Okay, so I have seen the challenge what they have got, and I have seen where my company, what we built, was sold to a larger company. Practo was much bigger, and we were smaller. We were mm-hmm. like uh, 100 people, whereas Practo was close to at that time 1500. Eighteen hundred people. So, so these things are are tough, believe me. Some of them because uh, the people who grew in a startup, okay, they don't know the big large world. Of course, I worked in a large company, so I could relate to it. Whereas a lot of my team, they couldn't relate to your larger. Company. Yeah. So, how did uh, you make them feel comfortable about this transition? Being an insta, being a small company, enjoying all the you know the culture, the privileges, and all that. Saying that now we are going to get absorbed into a larger company. As a leader, did they feel so, that uh, you yeah. are probably go- going into a new territory that they may not be comfortable with? So, see, see, the problem with large companies is the amount of explanation or justification we have to do to other groups, okay, which you don't need in a small company. In small company, everybody knows everything. So, your communication overhead, the meetings overhead, is very limited, okay. But in large companies, you have to communicate. okay so the the communication overhead is quite uh, is definitely much higher okay so a lot of meetings are considered the people who come from a startup as a waste of time okay uh, whereas in big companies meetings are the way you get things done okay so you have to explain in some sense taking sides on both ways one is you tell the larger company don't have so many meetings but at the same time you have to tell the people you need to have meeting you have to explain okay otherwise for example we want to work together you want to create synergies you want to where you can make 1 plus 1 equal to 3 you know, you have to have meetings okay so you have to spend time with the people in you know, explaining why it is needed what it is needed and because i worked in a larger company yes i could i could in some sense relate to it and explain that to the people what was it like or what advice would you have for people who are considering let's say getting into a startup mode in their 50s or you said when you started around 50 are there any considerations that are different that one has to go through before the fact i tell people it is good to start when you are 50s one you have wealth of experience you know what may work what will not work you you, you know uh, 50s also means you know your children would have grown or at least children are not dependent on you maybe you may have to still pay for the college fees and other things but they are not dependent on you okay so in what i tell people your ability to take risk is better before you are married or after your children have grown okay whereas people who take risk of starting in 30s okay when they are in some sense at their getting into peak of their career okay uh, it is more risky okay so i am not saying you shouldn't to do startup in 30s or something it depends on your situation but in general the ability to take risk is uh, is higher so i didn't really feel i was taking a big risk okay, okay. that, that also of course also... i also felt i have my if i don't do then then i would be keeping in back of my and i'm not able to do anything or i, I couldn't uh, i'm leaving some things what i wanted to do but couldn't complete you will have that slight dissatisfaction in your mind uh, that's why i thought i should do and on hindsight if you ask me you know it's not that i made more money uh, than i have continued in wipro maybe i think i would have i made just about the same money or even less money than i have if i had continued in wipro but the experience that added to me there is no way i would have got that in wipro the experience of going through fundraising going through decisions on uh, you want to sell you don't want to sell or going through some we had tough time in terms of uh, managing the cash flows okay uh, we were profitable but we didn't have cash okay uh, yeah. i know what i went through in uh, cash management in fact for 3 years uh, we had only one month of cash so 36 months every month managing do i have cash to pay my salary mm-hmm. and luckily we never missed paying salaries all 36 months we were able to make the salaries okay oh, nice. uh, but it was tough okay mm-hmm. so so you really get into certain level of depth uh, you uh, you won't believe okay 
uh, in fact i remember one advice is when i was leaving premji told me he said uh, you know the biggest challenge you will face is in cash flows mm-hmm. and monitor cash flows mm. okay that is the only advice he gave to me okay so so i was really focusing you know what do i do in terms of uh, following on the cash flows yeah yeah in fact uh, the post covid or all these things the advice to startups everyone is na conserve cash yes yeah, yeah. see one um, interesting thing i still can't accept that uh, you know you are post retirement you know, mm. after so much of activity and hectic uh, life and all that what does retirement mean to you or what are your current interests mm. so uh, see, see, it, um, my definition of retirement is no full time job okay that is how i define okay so i don't have to i don't i'm not going to work every day you know uh, you get up in the morning you know you have to go to office or you have to sit in front of the desk and start at uh, 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock whatever is your time and you work till the evening five days a week right that is that is if i am not doing that then it is that is a retirement so it means okay. you work as per your pace mm-hmm. and you work on what you want to do mm-hmm. the second rule i kept myself is i am not going to take a targets anymore okay mm-hmm. believe me i have taken targets <laughs> for uh, uh, you know uh, i think uh, when did i take target my first target we took when we got that ge business <laughs> okay so i said i ran with targets for 30 years i am not going to take targets anymore i will only yeah. somebody else is responsible for targets i will only go into monitor or review mm. okay so that is the that is the second aspect of retirement the third aspect of retirement what i really like is previously you are engaged with only one company with one goal or rather not one goal one related goals you know mm-hmm. but around one company or one business mm. Mm. now you can do many things mm. okay so in fact i am i am try working on two volunteer kind of work and i am working on two companies as a board member okay so i am engaged in four activities okay uh, completely different and uh, it gives you exposure you can touch more people so mm-hmm. it is not that when you are working one thing i feel proud in wipro was that yes when we started 200 in the end with uh, of course not me alone there is a large team we were all able to create a large joint organization and yeah. created employment create opportunities for so many people so by working with the multiple people uh, i thought i can touch similarly larger number of people without focusing on one single company so yeah, very nice so what are your other interest do you have time for anything else i have i have time i i spend a lot of time reading okay i love reading a member of a book club so we discuss okay. books uh, every month one book every month i do both reading on my kindle reading in you know, through audio also i started okay so that way you know i can walk and listen to uh, certain things so that is my big one of course the reading has started because of all my travels in my pro days mm. uh, i used to travel a lot particularly international travel you know it take a lot of time so books was one of the best ways of spending time and travel Nice. The other my passion is golf. I play golf every week. Oh, okay. I try to play twice a week. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so that gives good enough physical exercise plus uh, you keep in touch with uh, very interesting people. Yeah, good. So we normally close the conversation in an episode with uh, your advice for people who are either aspiring to get into IT mm-hmm. or some of those mid career who want to either change to non IT. and you see that a lot in bangalore nowadays mm-hmm. what would be your advice see my advice to it people or anybody who wants to be in it industry is that you have to be ready to be a student if you are not ready to be a student and continuously learn you will not be able to succeed so if you don't have that mental makeup that i am ready to read i am ready to learn i am ready to join some courses and pick up things if one doesn't have that kind of an attitude then it is not a career because it the tech will become outdated in a 100% way every time so you will completely get new it is not that one cannot adapt but you have to uh, one has to adapt that is that is the big one the second question is can people move from uh, it to other industries or other industries to it uh, i can tell you in uh, again in 
Wipro or even in some of my Insta job, I was never focused on how much of a prior experience that person had on that area. I was looking for people, what is their aptitude? Are they ready to learn? Are they ready to adapt? And do they have inside them the readiness to learn? Okay. If you have that and you say, I'm ready to learn from somebody junior, somebody senior, somebody whoever it is, I don't see any reason why IT people can't work in other industries, particularly, for example, in uh, customer support kind of functions, account management kind of functions, or in BU management kind of functions. Uh, I see IT, why IT people can't work in uh, in other industries. It's, it is very much possible because the, the principles for some of them are the same in all the in all the places. But of course, uh, the, the question is, you know, is there a big need? Because IT industry itself is growing and uh, there are enough opportunities there also. Yeah, it's more about the burnout. Many yeah. people feel that you know, it has been too taxing or whatever. At yeah. least... So, uh, see, see, again, on the burnout, I uh, maybe for some reason, I never felt burnout in my life. Mm. Okay. Uh, it's not that uh, I was always meeting targets. I know we missed targets. I know I disappointed some people in not uh, meeting the targets or we failed in customer projects. And I know the conversations I had with customers who are very unhappy. Okay. But you cannot take all of them at a personal level. Okay. The mm -hmm. moment you take them at a personal level, that is when the burnout comes. Mm -hmm. Right. You feel helpless. When you are helpless is when thing. But if you say, no, I'm working with my team and uh, we were all in it together. And if your challenge or a grief or uh, uh, this one is shared with the people, okay, then you will feel little less. Okay. So I, I saw the managers burn out when they and their team were not together. Okay. okay. The, the team feels, uh, no, no, we, are, we have done our best. Okay. And the manager feels uh, somehow he's responsible for the team not doing it. Okay. That is when, if you don't have that shared feeling and when the whole burden comes to you, you will feel a lot more burnout. That's a very good insight, Ramesh. I think that's about all the time we have for this conversation, but there are a lot more unanswered questions and a lot more interesting questions, particularly the ones around uh, talking, having difficult conversations with uh, customers, employees, partners. We didn't really get into those aspects today, but I'm sure uh, we'll find an opportunity to talk again soon. Sure, sure. Uh, in fact, one more thing I I must say I really enjoyed, and uh, not many people sometimes get this one, is the whole international exposure. Working not just with the U.S. people, working with the uh, Finnish people to Japanese people to Chinese people to to, to Germans, French, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that, that whole thing is, 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 a, is a great experience. You you see uh, humans, people, in the end, you realize they're all the same, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but the nuances, what you see, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, if sometimes if you can see it in a detached way, it is, it is, it is, it is very, very interesting. Yeah, so that's probably yeah. another episode. That, uh, yeah, <laughs> right, absolutely. So thanks a lot, Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you, Shogaru. Nice participating here. Yeah. We thank Siddharth for the music and Malavika for promoting the Software People stories. If you like this episode, please subscribe on your favorite podcast client and spread the word in your network. If you'd like to share your story, contact us at podcasts at pm-powerconsulting.com.